Good afternoon. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Grace be to you and peace from the God who is, who was, and who is to come. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the earth. We're gathered here to praise God, to witness to our faith, and to give thanks for the life of Emma Jean Rock. We come together in grief, acknowledging our loss. May God grant us pain. May God give us grace that in pain we may find comfort. In sorrow we may find hope. And in death we may find resurrection. Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restores our life. And in baptism, Emma Jean Rock was sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Would you pray with me? God, our comforter, you are our refuge and strength, a helper close at hand in times of distress. You forgive what we have done and what we have left undone. Your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Help us to hear the words of our faith that our fear is dispelled and our loneliness eased and our hope reawakened. May your spirit lift us above our natural sorrow to the peace and light of your constant love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now I want to share with all of you and Doug, Gene's son, would like to share with all of you as well a, a, a poem that Doug wrote. He wrote this today and asked me if I would share it with all of you. So now, hear that from Doug. In case you didn't know it, I'm kind of the family poet. For birthdays, anniversaries, or any special event, I would write things down before they came and went. This time, things are harder because I feel much worse. No creative rhyme or even a clearer verse. With a broken heart, it's hard to know where to start. Since you are here today, Jean must have touched you in some special way. A mom, grandma, sister, or more, everyone was always welcome at her door. With a meal or games or maybe a snack, she would always tell you, make sure you come back. With the huge void in our family that will never quite be refilled, to see everyone here, she would be so thrilled. She never wanted you to leave saying, just stay a little more. Sometimes I was worried she was going to lock the door. Now she's rejoicing in heaven with all who've gone before. No more pain, no more suffering. Who could ask for more? So when I look at the stars, I think I'll look at them in a different way, knowing that you are in heaven just waiting for us to join you someday. So until that day comes, our memories will be saving because we all know that you are at heaven's door smiling and waving. Now I want to invite you to join us in singing a hymn that Jean picked out herself for us all to sing today. Uh, we'll sing the hymn, What a Day That Will Be, and you can sing with us by using the words on the screen behind me.
doesn't seem quite fair. Kurt gets to read an original poem, I get to read the obituary. <laughs> but this is a way of honoring those who have gone before, finding our place in God's story. So listen to the obituary. Emma Jean Ruth was the daughter of Herman and Tilly Malvin Hall. She grew up on her family's farm and graduated from the Sioux Center High School. She was united in marriage to Kenneth Lee Van Toff on August 18, 1954 in Middleburg. The couple made their home on a farm by Newkirk, a little bit south, a little bit east, if I'm not mistaken, where together they farmed and raised their two children, Laura and Doug. Ken passed away April 25th, 1982 in Orange City after a brief battle with cancer. Following her husband's passing, Jean lived on the farm for a few years before moving to an apartment in Orange City. On the 12th of October, 1985, she was married to Donald Gerard Rock in Orange City, and they made their home here in Hospers. Spent many happy years together, traveling, going fishing, taking day trips, exploring the countryside. In 2011, she and Don moved to the Sunrise Home Co-op here in Hospers, otherwise known as the Tenplex. Don passed away on July 20th, 2012, in Orange City. Mrs. Rock, yeah, Jean. She was a faithful member of the First Reformed Church in Hospers and in earlier years of the Newkirk Reformed Church. She enjoyed setting a beautiful table for friends and family to share coffee or a meal together. When at home, she could often be found watching Hallmark or QVC, home shopping channels. She looked forward to her weekly pizza night with friends and Sunday lunch with the girls from Newkirk. All oh, those girls from Newkirk. Her greatest joy was being a mother and a grandmother and she loved to attend the various activities of her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren. She survived by her two children and their spouses, Laura and Thomas Wakefield of Spencer, Douglas and Denise, Denise Venthoff of Hudson, South Dakota, five grandchildren, Emma Wakefield, Mark Wakefield, Jennifer and her husband, Bradley Waddle, Kendra, and her husband, Joe Heitreiter, and Tonell Venthoff, and her special friend, Keith Gibson. Six great-grandchildren, Lane, Ada, and Ezra Waddle, and Lucy, Rose, and Nora Heitreiter. Three stepchildren, Dave Rock and his wife Arlene, and Joan and her husband, Galen Hawk, all of Hospers, and Sharon Gumto of Chandler, Arizona. Thirteen step-grandchildren, Ruth Custer, Rachel Law, Paul Rock, Michael Gumto, Mark Gumto, James Hawk, Daniel Hawk, Laura Evink, Amy Hawk, and Matthew, Michael, Christopher, and Caitlin Hummenberg. Eighteen step-great-grandchildren. This is a mouthful, you know. <laughs> a sister and her husband, uh, Dawn and Dennis Beltman of Orange City. Two sisters-in-law, Joan Venthoff of Orange City and Sharon Venthoff of Hospers, as well as numerous nieces and nephews. Now, that's a lot of nuts and bolts to try to wrap your mouth around. But in addition to her parents and her Husbands, She was preceded in death by stepson-in-law Richard Gumto, a brother and his wife William and Mildred Van, Van Hall, a sister and her husband Francis and Howard uh, Van Gorp, and two brothers-in-law Lloyd Van Hoff and Ron Van Hoff. And like I said, that's the nuts and bolts of it, but some of the granddaughters, I believe, want to come, and they'll, they'll give you a little more, put a little meat on those bones, I think. on? Yeah, okay. Whew, my heart is racing. Um, grandma, is there anything more special than a grandmother? Um, she was a Christian, selfless, a great party planner, a major worrier, and an all-around wonderful woman who loved her family well, and her babies meant everything to her. Every Sunday morning, you could find her sitting in church, singing her favorite hymns. She loved her Bible and always kept it by her side. She cared about other people more than herself. Everyone was always welcome at her table. I think that's the third time you've heard this now. <laughs> and she never wanted anyone to leave. When you did finally convince her that you really had to go, she would follow you out to your vehicle. And as you would drive away, she would stand on the driveway waving until you couldn't see her anymore. You never left upset or hungry. 
If she wasn't going to see you in person, you knew you would expect a card in the mail for your birthday or holidays. Even in her last days, she took the time to personally write in a card and give a gift for a loved one's birthday. She was a huge supporter of her babies. She sat at countless sporting and music events and church programs. She threw the best parties with the most beautifully decorated table. She took her centerpieces and table settings very seriously, and they had to be set just so. This went back to when my dad was young, and he would come running into the house with all of his friends for his birthday parties, and each boy would have their own table, plate at the table, and trinket. <clears throat> I'm her firstborn grandchild. This just kind of tells you about how worried she was. Um, she was so worried that something was going to be wrong with me when I was born that she locked herself in her apartment and didn't want to come out until she was assured many times that I was strong and healthy. She always thought of everyone and worried that everyone would be kept safe from harm. As grandkids, we have many memories of walking to the drive-in for burgers, fries, and shakes, walking to her house after school, playing restaurant for countless hours, and around Christmas time with our cousins at Grandma's to decorate cookies. I was lucky enough to be spoiled just me by, with Grandma when there was a blizzard and I walked, uh, was in Hospers Elementary and I got to spend just the day with her. She always had a tissue and strong Tic Tacs in her purse. She spoiled you as much as she could. Visiting the local grocery store in Hospers, you always came back with a treat and toy. In order to get your gift at Christmas, you had to play a game. When you thought all the gift giving was done, out came another bag. We were lucky to get to have some amazing girls weekends in Des Moines with her. We got to do a couple of her favorite things, shop and eat delicious food. And everyone who knew her knew she loved car rides, fishing, playing games, countless games of Farkle. Uh, I'm pretty sure the table was worn from where they played so much Farkle. Hallmark movies and QVC. But above all of that, she loved family and her God the most. We know you are running free and will always be watching over us. We love you. And Joan, Jim, Laura, it's your turn. like to sing one of Jean's favorite songs, Amazing Grace.
almost think you've already heard the sermon, so, you know. Grace will lead me home. I asked Jean when uh, I went to visit her, you have any favorite scriptures? And she said, Psalms. <laughs> well, that narrows it down a lot. Um, she said, you choose. A little bit later, I found out the 23rd Psalm, which is most everybody's favorite, but we'll start with that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths, or the paths of righteousness, for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, or the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long or forever. I want to go to Psalm 90 and 91. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You've been our dwelling place, Lord. Psalm 91, you who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Psalm 116 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Jesus gave us a glimpse of that dwelling place or he promised to take us there in John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places or many homes. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you'll know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you've seen him. A little bit later, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him because he lives with you, abides in you, and will be, with you, uh, will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, says Jesus. And then John, the end of Revelation, gives us a glimpse also of heaven. I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for the first earth, first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among people. He will dwell with them, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more, mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. So she said, you choose. I'm going to read Psalm 84. But before we do that, let's begin. Let's pray. Lord, we see words in black and white on a piece of paper or up on the screen or maybe just ringing through the air to our ears. Take those words, Lord, and use them to speak your truth. Christ's name we pray this. Amen. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts. My King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praises. 
Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold your sh our shield, our God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your court, it's better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. So ends the reading at this time. Now, I have to confess, I did pull a bit of a no-no. I visited Jean at Sanford Hospital in Sioux Falls at Doug's request. He thought it would lift her spirits. It did. I figured I could ask forgiveness from Kurt and the consistory for stepping on their toes. After a few minutes of small talk, we got down to what she really wanted to talk about, and she asked me to do her funeral, whatever that means. And as a friend and as a pastor, a previous pastor, I really couldn't say no. I mean, how do you say no to Jean? And then she added, I just want to go home. And I know she didn't mean home to hospice. I just wanted to go home. Now, I didn't get a chance to see her in Orange City, but I know she repeated that same phrase while in Orange City just want to go home. And she couldn't bear the thought of being transferred to Sanford, Sanborn and starting all over again and, and forget the government and the hospital rules and all the regulations. Just let me go home. She had this intense longing to go home to heaven. And towards the end, she said she felt like she was climbing stairs. And somebody asked her, are you trying to get upstairs at her old house? No, I'm going upstairs to heaven. Felt like hard work. She was on a journey. She was on a pilgrimage. Psalm 84 is a pilgrimage psalm. People are going to the temple. That's where God lived. That was the center of God's presence on this earth. They anticipated, they longed for the ability to find their center there, to center themselves in the presence of God, in their home. My soul yearns or faints for the courts of the Lord. And in John 14, you heard it, Jesus promises a home, a place for the disciples who were feeling lost after Jesus had informed them that he was going to be leaving. The question is, what's home? Where is it? Sometimes it has a number, 14444, it's one of mine, 917, 503, room 19 at my grade school, the dormitory where I went to boarding school, the mud hut at the end of the dirt road, one no house number on that one. Those are some of the house numbers where I've lived over the years in a couple of different countries, places I've called home, and I imagine that if I gave you just a few minutes, it wouldn't take long, you you could easily draw up your own unique list of the numbers that bring to mind vivid memories, longings. We heard some of them this morning, this afternoon, actually. Home, it's a very simple word, isn't it? Four letters, but boy, does it carry weight. A lot of weight. Charles Dickens once wrote that home is, strong, is a stronger word than any magician or conjurer ever spoke. And simply saying the word can bring up a longing so intense that it can only be described in terms of, of almost a physical ailment. Have you ever thought of homesickness? Although I remember one little kid in my elementary dormitory just got back to school and was missing mom and dad, and a dorm mother said, are you homesick? And he said, no, I'm not homesick, I'm here sick. That makes more sense, doesn't it? I want to get out of here. I think maybe Jean was just a bit here sick. Longings for home. 
They punctuate our books and our movies and our music. You know, there's no place like home. Home's where the heart is. I'll be home for Christmas if only in my dreams. Can't go home again. Maybe that's why Gene enjoyed all those Hallmark channels so much. You know, most of those things are about going home somewhere. That's why she'd stay up till 3 a.m. with Emily Johnson (laughs) watching Home Channel movies or Hallmark movies and then go home. And home is so much more than a place, isn't it? It's the people who make a house a home. It's family, it's friends, it's spending time together. It's listening to stories, laughing at family stories. It's remembering that time when Don and Jean were trying to put their boat in and Jean got stuck with one foot on the boat and one foot on the dock and it kept going, the wind took it and took it apart and she ended up going backwards into the water and this prim and proper lady with all her, all her dignity had to, rising up out of the water and it's, it's just kind of fun. Stories. Or a very similar thing happened earlier in her life when, when she... Uh, went boating with Ken, husband Ken at that time, and the water was, the water was starting to come. He would take some, some turns a bit short, and the water would come in the boat, and as they were coming back to the dock, it got deeper and deeper inside the boat, and finally the boat just sunk. She's out there, I can't swim, I can't swim, and Ken, who couldn't swim either, stood up and said, why don't you try standing up? It's up to here. <laughs> Stories family, home. Some of the traveling stories I heard about yesterday, Don and Jean, been mentioned a couple times. They were travelers. You never knew where they'd end up. Down in Branson, Missouri, one day trip. Or down at Correctionville or Independence, Iowa. I think they were gone their way back from Independence one day when they both fell asleep. Ended up in the ditch Tow, driver, tow truck driver got there and he talked on back to dispatch and he just said, ah, I'm just pulling a couple old people out of the ditch. And they were laughing about it. You start thumbing through the old photo albums or looking at the tribute video and we laugh at the big hair and shoulder pads and the out of fa- style fashions and, and the stories we can tell. But that laughter kind of catches in our throats and our nest starts to feel a bit empty Home is people. But home is also food. Jean, as the obituary says and has been mentioned a couple of times, enjoyed setting a beautiful table for friends and family to share coffee or a meal. And at Thanksgiving, she would ask you what your favorite pie was, and she would make the entire pie for each person's favorite. A whole spread of pie just for yourself. And do I need to mention the turkey buns? People loved them. And when you went to Jean's home, you felt needed and you felt valued. And it was a favorite place for kids and, well, kids both great and grand and great grand because they knew exactly where she kept her candy dish. And Grandma was always giving. And even though her life involved two husbands and two distinct families, she knew how to make everyone feel special and needed. And Rachel told me a story yesterday of a time she was sitting in church and it was a hard time in her life and it was a hard time sitting in church and she, she felt that she just couldn't sit there anymore and had to get up and go out into the narthex. And, and Jean noticed that, got up, went out, sat with her, just knew exactly what she needed. I don't know if there any words were spoken or not, but she was very sensitive, Jean was. She had a place in her heart for family, for kids, for stepkids, for adopted kids, because they were all family. Psalm 84 talks about going through the Valley of Baca. That valley was a place that was known for being a place that was hard to get through. It was kind of a wilderness situation. And yet you had to get through that in order to get to the temple. And it talks about being surrounded by your traveling companions. 
That's where you found your strength. Those who traveled with you. Psalm 23 talks about the valley of the shadow of death. We fear no evil because you, our shepherd, are our rod and our staff, our comfort and our safety. John 14, Jesus promises, I will not leave you orphans. I will comfort you. I will send that comforter, the Holy Spirit. And as Christians, we do not go to this, on this pilgrimage alone. And Jesus, uh, Jean knew that. Joan says that Jean waited until she and Galen got home from being up north, farming up there, helping out anyway. Jean wanted to be surrounded by as much family as she could gather together as much support as possible. Just wanted to go home, said Jean. But what if the home we long for is not a physical place, but a person? The Bible whispers the eternal God is your dwelling place. It's your home. He is, God is your home. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Find that in Deuteronomy 33. And Jesus comforted his disciples on the night before his crucifixion. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. When everything's ready, I'll come. I'll get you. So that you will always be where I am. In fact, the whole Bible, if you look at the scope of it, tells a story that makes sense of our built-in longing for for home. The opening pages of the Bible describe a perfect home shared with God, and it, it tells about the events that led to humanity's eviction from their home. And in the Bible's closing pages, you got the perfect picture of humanity welcomed home into the direct presence of God. And as the story unfolds between those two bookends, God unwaveringly pursues his mission to rescue human beings and restore creation. And he does so by means of making his home in the midst of people. That's what the incarnation is all about. That's why Jesus came. The old Heidelberg Catechism asks the question, what's my only comfort in life as well as in death? And the answer it gives is my comfort is that I belong in life as well as in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. As Christians, that's the place where we belong. That's where we find our center. That is our home in Jesus Christ. Find it there. Let's pray. Lord, from the beginning of the first day of creation, you have loved for and cared for your people. It's by your hand we were created. It's in your hand, your good hands that we live, and it's to your hands that we return again. And you've taken the time to reveal yourself in a lot of different ways until in the, in the fullness of time, says the Bible, your word was made flesh and lived among us in the person of Jesus Christ. In his life, his death, his resurrection, that's where we find our calling, our home in this world and our hope for the world to come. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance of that hope. And Lord, you know that there are times when we grieve. You understand that because you felt our pain. That's part of why you came as well. We think of Jesus weeping with Mary and Martha at the death of Lazarus and the heavens that were darkened when your own son died on the cross. Comfort us with the sure knowledge that Jesus raised his friend and will raise all who hear his voice because he destroyed the darkness of death when you raised him, from, raised him to the light of Easter morning. And so today, this afternoon, we, we give you thanks for your people, people who, who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you in your house. And especially, we thank you for Jean, for the gift of her life, for the grace that you have given her, for all in her that was good and kind and faithful. 
We thank you for her love of the church, for her love of extended family, for her self-giving spirit, for her hospitality and welcome to all. We also thank you that for her, death is now past, and the pain that she endured is ended, and she has entered into the joy that you have prepared in the company of all the saints and reunited with loved ones. So give us faith to look beyond touch and sight and in seeing that we are surrounded by this, this great cloud of witnesses. Enable us also to run with perseverance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And bring us at last to your eternal peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We want to invite you one more time to sing a hymn that Jean desired that we would all sing together as we're gathered. So again, would you join me by using the words on the screen to sing the hymn, It Is Well.
Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Imogene Rock. Acknowledge, we pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Now we would like to invite you to join us in, in, in continuing to praise God for his faithfulness and rejoicing and celebrating the life of Imogene Rock at the Newkirk Cemetery. 